Hello dear viewers, this is AI Voice Gary, speaking to you as Buddy from Town's Narrator. I hope you are all in good spirits. Since Buddy from Town began his journey to become science literate, he has discussed many stages of the Big Bang, and he has created a number of videos about the various stages. In this YouTube video, Buddy of Town has compiled all of the videos about the stages of the Big Bang into one video, from the quantum singularity to the stages of the very early universe, to the stages of the early universe. When Buddy first started his exploration of the universe, he was a bit of a novice at video creation and editing, so you will find some images that are a bit blurred. However, he does get better with each video created. So, enjoy dear viewers. According to most astrophysicists, all the matter found in the universe today, including the matter in people, plants, animals, the earth, stars, and galaxies, was created at the very first moment of time, thought to be about 13.8 billion years ago. The universe began, scientists believe, with every speck of its energy jammed into a very tiny point. This extremely dense point exploded with unimaginable force, creating matter and propelling it outward to make the billions of galaxies of our vast universe. Astrophysicists dubbed this titanic explosion the Big Bang. To understand the origins of the universe, you have to go backward in time to a point where time equals zero, that is, t equals zero, or precisely when time began. The most widely peer-reviewed and accepted theory on the origins of the universe is the Big Bang theory. It may seem difficult to imagine a time, about 13.77 billion years ago, when the entire universe existed as an infinitesimal singularity. However, the Big Bang theory basically says the universe, as we know it, started with an infinitely hot, infinitely dense, compact, singularity existing in a form. Smaller than a subatomic particle. Smaller than these particle images. The singularity contained all the matter in the cosmos, all of space itself. So everything we know of the beginning, was a point of infinite denseness and infinite heat. A few millionths of a second later, quarks aggregated to produce protons and neutrons, combining within three minutes to produce the nuclei of light elements. As the universe continued to expand and cool, things began to happen more slowly. It has long been theorized that hydrogen, helium, and lithium were the only chemical elements in existence during the Big Bang, when the universe formed, and that supernova explosions, stars exploding at the end of their lifetime, are responsible for transmuting these elements into heavier ones and distributing them throughout our universe. The Big Bang was the instantaneous creation of all of space and time, containing energy to drive the expansion, and enough matter for over 100 billion galaxies. There was so much energy in the universe during those first few moments that matter as we know it couldn't form. As the universe expanded, matter began to form and radiation began to lose energy. In only a few seconds, the universe formed out of this singularity that stretched across space. It took 380,000 years for electrons to be trapped in orbits around nuclei, forming the first atoms. A hundred million years later, the first stars began to grow in hydrogen clouds. So what does this mean? This singularity containing all the matter in the cosmos, all of space itself. The initial singularity of seemingly infinite density is thought to have contained all of the mass and space-time of the universe, before quantum fluctuations caused it to rapidly expand in the Big Bang, and subsequent inflation, creating the present-day universe. The initial state can only be described by a theory that unites gravity and the quantum world. At present, we do not have such a theory. This period known as cosmic inflation will be discussed in a future video. Extrapolation of the expansion of the universe backwards in time using general relativity produces boundless, or infinite density and temperature at a bounded, or finite time in the past. A side note. General relativity in its simplest description, is a theory of gravitation developed by Albert Einstein between 1907 and 1915. It says that the observed gravitational effect between masses results from their warping of space-time. So, this quantum singularity indicates that general relativity is not a sufficient description of the laws of physics at this time scale. In other words, 
models based solely on general relativity cannot extrapolate toward the singularity beyond the end of the Planck epoch. The Planck epoch is the earliest period of time in the history of the universe. In Big Bang cosmology, the Planck epoch, or Planck era, is the earliest stage of the Big Bang, before the time passed was equal to the Planck time, TP, or approximately 10 to the minus 43 seconds. It should be noted that some sources have 10 to minus 44 seconds and others have 10 to minus 41 seconds. Planck time is the time it would take a photon traveling at the speed of light to cross a distance equal to the Planck length. This is the quantum of time, the smallest measurement of time that has any meaning, and is equal to 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Within the framework of the laws of physics as we understand them today, no smaller division of time has any meaning, therefore, we can say only that the universe came into existence when it already had an age of 10 to the minus 43 seconds. A side note. It is generally assumed that quantum effects of gravity dominate physical interactions at this time scale. In response to the inaccuracy of considering only general relativity, as in the traditional model of the Big Bang, alternative theoretical formulations for the beginning of the universe have been proposed, including a string theory-based model in which two brains, enormous membranes much larger than the universe, collided, creating mass and energy. Although there is no direct evidence for a singularity of infinite density, the cosmic microwave background is evidence that the universe expanded from a very hot, dense state. More detail on the cosmic microwave background in a later video. The Big Bang theory is firmly established and backed up by three lines of evidence. From speeding galaxies to ancient gas clouds, there is a lot of evidence that we can detect today. There are remnants of the Big Bang that tell a clear story about the origins of our universe. The first is that the universe is expanding. Galaxies are flying apart so in the past everything was closer together and must once have been in one spot. The second is the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation, CMB, the afterglow of the hot young universe. WMAP launched on June 30, 2001, with the goal of sensing subtle temperature differences in the cosmic microwave background, that is, the glow of the first atoms to release their radiation 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Since then, it has provided the most accurate measurement of the age of the universe, proved the existence of dark energy, showed that just 4% of the universe is made of ordinary matter, and supported the idea that the universe inflated from subatomic scale to the size of a soccer ball in its first trillionth of a second. A 2013 map of the background radiation left over from the Big Bang, taken by the ESA's Planck spacecraft, captured the oldest light in the universe. Planck's observations mapped the background in unprecedented detail and revealed that the universe was older than previously thought, 13.82 billion years old, rather than 13.7 billion years old. The Research Observatory's mission is ongoing and new maps of the CMB are released periodically. And the third remnant of the Big Bang that demonstrates the origins of the universe. The abundance of light elements, deuterium, helium and lithium, in stars and gas clouds are as expected if they formed by the nuclear process in the Big Bang fireball. The evidence points to the Big Bang occurring about 13.8 billion years ago. The universe then swelled rapidly for a fraction of a second, a period known as cosmic inflation, and expanded steadily, cooling as it did so. So, we are left with the question, who or what cracked the cosmic rat? Or, who or what did the cosmic fart? In other words, how did the singularity come to be? One of the common misconceptions about the Big Bang model is that it fully explains the origin of the universe. The Big Bang is an attempt to explain how the universe developed from a very tiny, dense state into what it is today. It doesn't attempt to explain what initiated the creation of the universe, or what came before the Big Bang, or even what lies outside the universe. However, the Big Bang model does not describe how energy, time, and space were caused, but rather it describes the emergence of the present universe from an ultra-dense and high-temperature initial state. While it is not known what could have preceded the hot dense state of the early universe or how and why it originated, there is much speculation on the subject of cosmogony. Some speculative proposals in this regard, each of which entails untested hypotheses, include 1. 
The Big Bang was caused by quantum fluctuations. The Big Bang can be thought of as a quantum event, originating from very chaotic space-time in which the other quantum fluctuations might have led to other parallel universes that scenario had very little chance of happening, but, according to the totalitarian principle, even the most improbable event will eventually happen. It took place instantly, due to the absence of perceived time before the Big Bang. 2. Models in which the whole of space-time is finite. For these cases, the Big Bang does represent the limit of time but without a singularity. In such a case, the universe is self-sufficient. 3. Brain cosmology models, in which inflation is due to the movement of brains in string theory. The pre-Big Bang model, the eek pyrotic model, in which the Big Bang is the result of a collision between brains, and the cyclic model, a variant of the eek pyrotic model in which collisions occur periodically. In the latter model the Big Bang was preceded by a big crunch and the universe cycles from one process to the other. 4. Eternal inflation, in which universal inflation ends locally here and there in a random fashion, each end point leading to a bubble universe, expanding from its own Big Bang. Proposals in the last two categories see the Big Bang as an event in either a much larger and older universe, or in a multiverse. And 5. Religious and Philosophical Interpretations As a description of the origin of the universe, the Big Bang has significant bearing on religion and philosophy. Some believe the Big Bang implies a creator. So what did Buddy of Town learn about the quantum singularity and its burst? There was a lot of compaction, pressure and heat build up in that quantum singularity containing everything needed to ultimately create the universe we see today. It took place a long time ago. More than 18 billion years. We are unable to go back to time equals zero, but we are pretty close. We are unable to determine how the singularity came to be, but there are lots of theories. You can still align with a religion and follow science. It does not have to be one or the other. And, you can understand without knowing all of the complex calculations. In our next video, we will discuss the stages of the Big Bang, and evidence of the Big Bang. If you would like to follow along to see Buddy from Town become Buddy of Singularity, please click subscribe and a like would be appreciated. Until next time dear viewers, keep looking up and looking back, way way back. Hello dear viewers. I hope you are well. This is a voice, Gary, speaking to you as Buddy of Town's narrator. Yes, I have decided to give myself a name. It is a good name. In the last video, we discussed the Big Bang and quantum singularity stage at 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the singularity event. In this video, we will be discussing the Big Bang stage, quantum inflation. But first, we will revisit the Planck era and briefly discuss the stages leading to cosmic inflation. As previously discussed, the Planck epoch, or Planck time, took place at 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the event which began the known universe. During the Planck epoch, the temperature and average energies within the universe were so high that subatomic particles could not form. Even the four fundamental forces that shape the universe, that is gravitation, electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force, were combined and formed one fundamental force. Little is understood about physics at this temperature. Different hypotheses propose different scenarios. Traditional Big Bang cosmology predicts gravitational singularity before this time, but this theory relies on the theory of general relativity, which is thought to break down for this epoch due to quantum effects. In inflationary models of cosmology, times before the end of inflation, around 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the Big Bang, do not follow the same timeline as in traditional Big Bang cosmology. Models that describe the universe and physics during the Planck epoch are generally speculative and fall under the category of new physics. Examples include the Hartle-Hawking initial state, string theory landscape, string gas cosmology, and the eek pyrotic universe. The Grand Unification Epoch took place between 10 to the minus 43 seconds and 10 to minus 36 seconds after the event which began the known universe. As the universe expanded and cooled, it crossed transition temperatures at which forces separated from each other. Like steam turning to water, 
the fields which define our universe's fundamental forces and particles completely change their behaviors and structures when the temperature and energy fall below a certain point. These phase transitions in the universe's fundamental forces are believed to be caused by a phenomenon of quantum fields called symmetry breaking. Spacetime symmetries are all around us in the everyday world, the right and left sides of an animal body, the circular disk of the sun and moon, a wallpaper pattern, or even a repeated musical rhythm. And symmetry has become a fundamental way of expressing the laws of physics. Symmetry breaking is an important process in both biological evolution and the evolution of the universe as it moves in time through different eras. Wherever structure becomes more complex, symmetry, or at least the original symmetry, is lost. It is this breakdown of symmetry that theorists are trying to understand in reverse, because at the beginning of the universe, it was perfectly symmetrical, and as it cooled, symmetry breaking took place, creating the more complex and varied world of particle physics. In everyday terms, as the universe cools, it becomes possible for the quantum fields that create the forces and particles around us, to settle at lower energy levels, and with higher levels of stability. In doing so, they completely shift how they interact. Forces and interactions arise due to these fields, so the universe can behave very differently above and below a phase transition. Assuming that nature is described by a so-called grand unified theory, the grand unification epoch began with a phase transitions of this kind, when gravitation separated from the universal combined gauge force. This caused two forces to now exist, gravity, and an electro-strong interaction. There is no hard evidence yet, that such a combined force existed, but many physicists believe it did. The physics of this electro-strong interaction would be described by the grand unified theory. Ended with a second phase transition, as the electro-strong interaction in turn separated, and began to manifest as two separate interactions, called the strong and the electroweak interactions. The grand unification epoch ended at approximately 10 to the minus 36 seconds after the Big Bang. At this point several key events took place. The strong force separated from the other fundamental forces. It is possible that some part of this decay process violated the conservation of baryon number and gave rise to a small excess of matter over antimatter. This phase transition is also thought to have triggered the process of cosmic inflation that dominated the development of the universe during the following inflationary epoch. The next epoch is the electroweak epoch which took place between 10 to the minus 36 seconds, or the end of inflation, and 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the Big Bang. Depending on how epochs are defined, and the model being followed, the electroweak epoch may be considered to start before or after the inflationary epoch. In some models it is described as including the inflationary epoch. In other models, the electroweak epoch is said to begin after the inflationary epoch ended, at roughly 10 to the minus 32 seconds. According to traditional Big Bang cosmology, the electroweak epoch began 10 to the minus 36 seconds after the Big Bang, when the temperature of the universe was low enough, 1028 Kelvin, for the electronuclear force to begin to manifest as two separate interactions, the strong and the electroweak interactions. The exact point where electrostrong symmetry was broken is not certain, owing to speculative and as yet incomplete theoretical knowledge. Inflationary epoch and the rapid expansion of space is the next stage after the event causing the creation of the universe. The cosmic inflation theory was born as an extension of the Big Bang theory to explain how the universe was created, and how everyone and everything got here. Astronomers observe that the universe is expanding and has been doing so for about 13.8 years billion years. At the very earliest times, too early to see directly, the leading idea is known as cosmic inflation. American physicist Alan Guth proposed the theory of cosmic inflation in 1981. Since then, cosmic inflation has become an important concept in the study of the early universe, to the point that it's currently integrated into the standard model of cosmology that embraces the Big Bang theory. This theory supposes that the embryonic universe abruptly ballooned in size. Such a growth spurt would have ironed out any curves and warps in space, thus explaining the geometry of the universe today, and left behind slight non-uniformities that seeded galaxies. The inflationary epoch and expansion of space took place just before 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the event which began the known universe. 
At this point of the very early universe, the metric that defines distance within space suddenly and very rapidly changed in scale. Note. In general relativity, the metric tensor, the metric, is the fundamental object of study. The metric captures all the geometric and causal structure of spacetime, being used to define notions such as time, distance, volume, curvature, angle, and separation of the future and the past. So, within 10 to the minus 30 seconds, the universe enlarged by a factor of at least 1025 in every direction. It expanded at an accelerated rate, pulling regions of space apart faster than the speed of light. This change is known as inflation. Although light and objects within spacetime cannot travel faster than the speed of light, in this case, it was the metric governing the size and geometry of spacetime itself that changed in scale. Changes to the metric are not limited by the speed of light. There is good evidence that this happened, and it is widely accepted that it did take place. But the exact reasons why it happened are still being explored. So a range of models exist that explain why and how it took place. It is not yet clear which explanation is correct. In several of the more prominent models, it is thought to have been triggered by the separation of the strong and electroweak interactions which ended the grand unification epoch. One of the theoretical products of this phase transition was a scalar field called the inflaton field. As this field settled into its lowest energy state throughout the universe, it generated an enormous repulsive force that led to a rapid expansion of the metric that defines space itself. Inflation explains several observed properties of the current universe that are otherwise difficult to account for, including explaining how today's universe has ended up so exceedingly homogeneous, similar, on a very large scale, even though it was highly disordered in its earliest stages. It is not known exactly when the inflationary epoch ended, but it is thought to have been between 10-33 seconds and 10-32 seconds after the Big Bang. The rapid expansion of space meant that elementary particles remaining from the grand unification epoch were now distributed very thinly across the universe. However, the huge potential energy of the inflation field was released at the end of the inflationary epoch, as the inflaton field decayed into other particles, known as reheating. This heating effect led to the universe being repopulated with a dense, hot mixture of quarks, antiquarks and gluons. A quark is a type of elementary particle and a fundamental constituent of matter. Antiquark is the antiparticle of a quark, while quark is in the standard model, an elementary subatomic particle which forms matter. Quarks are never found alone in nature and combine to form hadrons, such as protons and neutrons. A gluon is an elementary particle that acts as the exchange particle for the strong force between quarks. It is analogous to the exchange of photons and the electromagnetic force between two charged particles. Gluons bind quarks together, forming hadrons such as protons and neutrons. In other models, reheating is often considered to mark the start of the electroweak epoch, and some theories, such as warm inflation, avoid a reheating phase entirely. In non-traditional versions of Big Bang theory, known as inflationary models, inflation ended at a temperature corresponding to roughly 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the Big Bang, but this does not imply that the inflationary era lasted less than 10 to the minus 32 seconds. To explain the observed homogeneity of the universe, the duration in these models must be longer than 10 to the minus 32 seconds. Therefore, in inflationary cosmology, the earliest meaningful time after the Big Bang is the time of the end of inflation. After inflation ended, the universe continued to expand, but at a much slower rate. The volume of space we observe today was a quadrillionth the size of an atom when inflation began. During inflation it grew to the size of a dime. In the billions of years since then, space has continued to expand but at a mellower pace, allowing structures such as galaxies to form. About 4 billion years ago the expansion gradually began to speed up again. This is believed to be due to dark energy becoming dominant in the universe's large-scale behavior. It is still expanding today. The theory of cosmic inflation proposes a period of extremely rapid exponential expansion of the universe during its first few moments, starting at 10-36 seconds after the Big Bang singularity. Astrophysicist Ethan Siegels explains the term exponential expansion as follows. If your universe were filled with radiation, 
it would expand like the square root of time, the distance between you and this particle scales as asymptotic t1 over 2. If your universe were filled with matter, it would expand like time to the two-thirds power, the distance between you and this particle scales as asymptotic t two-thirds. But when your universe inflates, space expands exponentially, like asymptotic eht, eht, where h is the expansion rate of the universe. Simply put, the universe developed from a tiny speck, hypothetically containing the entirety of space, into something much, much bigger. Cosmic inflation explains how this occurred uniformly in spite of the rapidness of the process. Inflation was invented to explain a couple of features of the universe that are really hard to explain without it. So what problems does cosmic inflation resolve? Even though the Big Bang theory seemed quite plausible because of the discovery of the CMB, there were a few problems with it. In other words, what the Big Bang theory predicted would happen in the universe as it grew has not actually happened. The three major problems with the Big Bang theory include 1. Flatness. The universe that we live in currently appears to be flat. The flatness problem basically questions why the universe density is so close to the critical density. The critical density is the average density of matter required for gravity to halt the expansion of the universe. A universe with a critical density is said to be flat. However, according to Big Bang cosmology, the curvature of the universe should grow with time. But, the Big Bang theory predicted that there would be at least some curvature to it due to initial irregularities in its shape that would become more prominent during the 14 billion years of growth and change. Also, Einstein's general theory of relativity states that mass, such as that created by the Big Bang should ultimately bend both space and time, creating a more curved universe. 2. Homogeneity the Big Bang theory would create a universe in which there were many variations in temperature in different areas due to the vast distances involved and the lack of time for heat energy to transfer from one place to another. However, in reality, the universe, specifically, the cosmic microwave background, CMB, has a very uniform temperature in all directions. Why is that the case? The homogeneity problem is also referred to as the horizon problem because it questions why the universe is uniform in all directions, a property called isotropy. Many distant regions of space in opposite directions are so far apart that, assuming a standard Big Bang expansion, they could never have been in causal contact with each other. This is because the travel time, for light, between them exceeds the age of the universe. Yet research has demonstrated that the cosmic microwave background temperature is uniform throughout the universe. This tells us that these regions must have been in contact with each other in the past. How can extremely distant zones in space have their matter and radiation distributed so evenly when they're too far apart to have been in casual contact with each other? Again, cosmic inflation is the answer. Its integration into the Big Bang theory implies that there was a stage in the early universe when everything was much closer. For the universe to get inflated or expanded, it must have been deflated or contracted first. The distant zones of space obtain the same temperature while interacting with each other before the inflationary process began, and kept it after it finished. 3. Magnetic Monopole The Big Bang theory predicts a universe in which the energy isn't distributed evenly, which means it would have a lot of magnetic monopoles in the coldest, most frozen parts of it. Magnetic monopoles are hypothetical particles that consist of an isolated magnet with only one magnetic pole. These are believed to exist at very low temperatures. However, they are not seen in the universe as the theory predicts. Why not? Inflation allows for magnetic monopoles to exist, but only if they were produced before the period of inflation. During inflation, the density of monopoles dropped exponentially, so their abundance also dropped to undetectable levels. The cosmic inflation theory was developed by particle physicist Alan Guth during the early 1980s to deal with the three problems presented by the Big Bang theory. He theorized that the reason why the universe appears to be flat is because of the extremely fast rate at which it grew. It may have doubled in size every 110 to the minus 35 seconds, and after doing this many, Many times, the universe would appear to be flat even if it was curved. This rapid expansion of the universe would also explain why we cannot observe anything but uniformity in its energy distribution. 
As for the magnetic monopoles, they may still be out there, but were formed too long ago and are simply too far away to find. There was much indirect evidence to support the cosmic inflation theory before direct evidence was found. A lot of this came from the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, or WMAP, which is a NASA Explorer satellite mission launched in 2001 designed to study the characteristics and properties of the universe. Data from the WMAP has shown that the observable universe is indeed flat and rapidly expanded. The data also explains how fluctuations in the density of cosmic matter led to the formation of stars and galaxies, and how the temperature of the CMB is relatively uniform. Between 2001 and 2010, NASA's unmanned spacecraft Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, WMAP, studied the cosmic microwave background and produced data indicating that the universe is, in fact, relatively flat. But the process of cosmic inflation would account for the near flatness that WMAP detected. The inflaton is a theoretical particle that would have shoved space to a gargantuan size in a fraction of a second before leaving the universe to expand far more gradually under its own cosmological constant. The inflaton's potential energy can cause the universe to expand at an accelerated rate. In the process, it can smooth and flatten the universe, provided the field remains on the plateau long enough, about 10 to the minus 30 seconds, to stretch the universe by a factor of 1025, or more, along each direction. Inflation ends when the field reaches the end of the plateau, and rushes downhill to the energy valley below. At this point, the potential energy converts into more familiar forms of energy, namely, the dark matter, which is hot ordinary matter and radiation that fill the universe today. The universe enters a period of modest, decelerating expansion during which the material coalesces into cosmic structures. Inflation smooths the universe just as stretching a rubber sheet smooths its wrinkles, but it does not do so perfectly. Small irregularities remain because of quantum effects. The laws of quantum physics dictate that a field such as the inflaton not have exactly the same strength everywhere in space but that it undergo random fluctuations. These fluctuations cause inflation to end at slightly different times in different regions of space, heating them to slightly different temperatures. These spatial variations are the seeds that will eventually grow into stars and galaxies. A prediction of inflationary theory is that the variations are nearly scale invariant. That is, they do not depend on the size of the region. They occur with equal magnitude on all scales, and confirm that the spatial variations in energy in the early universe were nearly scale invariant. The theory of cosmic inflation has been criticized by a number of scientists, including one of its co-founders, American physicist Paul Steinhardt. In 2013, Steinhardt and his team analyzed data collected by the Planck satellite and concluded that this seemed to rule out the simplest inflationary models. The more complex ones, however, required more parameters, more fine-tuning of those parameters, and more unlikely initial conditions. Steinhardt called it the unlikeliness problem. He even talked about bad inflation and good inflation. Not only is bad inflation more likely than good inflation, but the absence of inflation is also more likely than not, he explained in his paper titled The Inflation Debate. The unlikeliness is supported by scientists like British mathematician Roger Penrose who, according to Steinhardt, applied thermodynamic principles, to count the possible starting configurations of the inflaton and gravitational fields. Some of these configurations lead to inflation and thence to a nearly uniform, flat distribution of matter and a geometrically flat shape. Other configurations lead to a uniform, flat universe directly, without inflation. Both sets of configurations are rare, so obtaining a flat universe is unlikely overall. Penrose's shocking conclusion, though, was that obtaining a flat universe without inflation is much more likely than with inflation. The theory of cosmic inflation has also been accused of being too flexible, meaning that it can pave the way for so many outcomes that there is no way to disprove it, or to prove it. But the data seem to indicate that cosmic inflation doesn't only tie up the loose ends of the Big Bang theory, it may be correct, at least in some form. It has become widely accepted by many physicists because it has also led to new predictions which have been observationally confirmed. As Ethan Siegel says, inflation has literally met every threshold that science demands, with clever new tests becoming possible with improved observations and instrumentation. 
whenever the data has been capable of being collected inflation's predictions have been verified. When cosmic inflation came to a sudden and still mysterious end, the more classic descriptions of the Big Bang took hold. A flood of matter and radiation known as, reheating, began the process of populating our universe with the stuff we know today, particles, atoms, stars, galaxies and so on. This was all still within the first second after the universe began, when the temperature of everything was about 10 billion degrees Fahrenheit, 5.5 billion Celsius, according to NASA. The cosmos now contained a vast array of fundamental particles such as neutrons, electrons and protons, the eventual building blocks or raw material for everything we see today. So what did Buddy from town learn today? The early stages of the Big Bang result from theories which are examined and tested over and over to confirm or criticized findings. The more confirmations or verification, the more solid the theory. Whenever the data has been capable of being collected, inflation's predictions have been verified. Scientists are continuing to uncover new information. There is more clarity about how the eventual building blocks or raw material for everything we see today formed. In our next video, we will continue looking at key stages of the Big Bang. If you would like to follow along to see Buddy from Town become Buddy of Singularity, please click subscribe and a like would be appreciated. Until next time dear viewers, keep looking up and looking back, way way back. Hello dear viewers, this is AI Voice Gary, speaking as Buddy from Town's narrator. I hope you are all in good spirits. So far, the Buddy from Town Space Exploration YouTube channel has covered some of the key stages, but not all stages, of the Big Bang for the very early universe. This included, the Big Bang Quantum Singularity, the very early universe which included Planck Epoch, Grand Unification Epoch, Electroweak Epoch, Inflationary Epoch and the rapid expansion of space, and symmetry breaking. Now, we will move on to the early universe. We will continue with key Big Bang stages, not all of the stages, which will include Thermalization Epoch, the Quark Epoch, Baryogenesis, and Hadron Epoch. We are working our way to key stages that include Dark Ages, earliest structures and stars emerge, Ryanization, galaxies, clusters and superclusters, the universe as it appears today, and dark energy dominated era. Viewers, Buddy from Town is working his way through some of the key Big Bang stages so he can get to what is happening in space today. In our previous videos we covered the very early universe. Lasting around 370,000 years, initially, Various kinds of subatomic particles are formed in stages. These particles include almost equal amounts of matter and antimatter, so most of it quickly annihilates, leaving a small excess of matter in the universe. The early universe includes the Planck epoch, during which currently established laws of physics may not apply. The emergence in stages of the four known fundamental interactions or forces. First, gravitation, and later the electromagnetic, weak and strong interactions, and the expansion of space itself, and supercooling of the still immensely hot universe due to cosmic inflation. Tiny ripples in the universe at this stage are believed to be the basis of large-scale structures that formed much later. Different stages of the very early universe are understood to different extents. The earlier parts are beyond the grasp of practical experiments in particle physics but can be explored through other means. Now, viewers, we will move on to the early universe. First, a recap of electroweak epoch and early thermalization. This stage started anywhere between 10 to the minus 22 seconds and 10 to the minus 15 seconds after the Big Bang, until 10 to the minus 12 seconds after the Big Bang. Sometime after inflation, the created particles went through thermalization, where mutual interactions led to thermal equilibrium. The earliest stage of which scientists are quite confident about is some time before the electroweak symmetry breaking, at a temperature of around 1015 K, approximately 10 to the minus 15 seconds after the Big Bang. The electromagnetic and weak interaction have not yet separated, and as far as we know, all particles were massless, as the Higgs mechanism had not operated yet. However exotic massive particle-like entities, sphalerons, are thought to have existed. Electroweak epoch and early thermalization ended with electroweak symmetry breaking, 
according to the standard model of particle physics. Baryogenesis also happened at this stage, creating an imbalance between matter and antimatter, though in extensions to this model this may have happened earlier. Little is known about the details of these processes. The thermalization epoch took place during the early universe, before the recombination era, when the photons were hot enough to ionize hydrogen. In the process of thermalization, matter and radiation are in constant interaction such that their temperatures become identical. The process goes on until energy distribution reaches equilibrium. The system is said to be thermalized. In general, the natural tendency of a system is toward a state of equipartition of energy and uniform temperature that maximizes the system's entropy. An example of thermalization is the process undergone by high-energy neutrons as they lose energy by collision with a moderator. The density was so high that the interactions between matter and radiation were very numerous. Therefore, matter and photons were in constant contact, and their temperatures were the same. As a result, the radiation became thermalized. Thermalization results from energy exchange between the components constituting the system and their exchange with the outside medium. In a gas at a given temperature, molecules move with different velocities. The gas temperature corresponds to the mean velocity of the molecules, but individual molecules may deviate largely from the mean velocity. Some move very fast, others slowly, and change velocity upon collisions. Collisions reduce the energy of fast-moving molecules and increase that of slow ones. Some processes in the early universe occurred too slowly, compared to the expansion rate of the universe, to reach approximate thermodynamic equilibrium. Others were fast enough to reach thermalization. The parameter usually used to find out whether a process in the very early universe has reached thermal equilibrium is the ratio between the rate of the process, usually rate of collisions between particles, and the Hubble parameter. The larger the ratio, the more time particles had to thermalize before they were too far away from each other. The next stage is the the quark epoch. The quark epoch began approximately between 10 to the minus 12 seconds and 10 to the minus 5 seconds after the Big Bang. Now that the universe has cooled down to about 10 quadrillion degrees, and the four fundamental forces are separate, the universe had a higher degree of stability. It is here we begin to see the rapid formation of quarks and antiquarks. This was the period in the evolution of the early universe immediately after electroweak symmetry breaking, when the fundamental interactions of gravitation, electromagnetism, the strong interaction and the weak interaction had taken their present forms, but the temperature of the universe was still too high to allow quarks to bind together to form hadrons. So, during the quark epoch, the quark gluon plasma was too hot and too dense to be confined and form a subatomic particle. The universe was filled with a dense, hot, quark gluon plasma, containing quarks, leptons and their antiparticles. Collisions between particles were too energetic to allow quarks to combine into mesons or baryons. In one of the more strange twists of nature, a process known as baryogenesis caused a surplus of quarks to begin to accumulate. The buildup of quarks and the presence of gluons, a boson force carrier particle, caused the consistency of the universe to be a densely populated quark gluon soup. It is named as such because observation of particle collisions have given physicists reason to believe that the universe was a plasma at this point in time. The quark epoch ended when the universe was about 10 to the minus 5 seconds old, when the average energy of particle interactions had fallen below the binding energy of hadrons, or below the mass of lightest hadron, the pion. The following period, when quarks became confined within hadrons, is known as the hadron epoch. In physical cosmology, the hadron epoch started 20 microseconds after the Big Bang. The temperature of the universe had fallen sufficiently to allow the quarks from the preceding quark epoch to bind together into hadrons. Initially the temperature was high enough to allow the formation of hadron-antihadron pairs, which kept matter and antimatter in thermal equilibrium. Following the annihilation of matter and antimatter, a nanoasymmetry of matter remains to the present day. Most of the hadrons and antihadrons were eliminated in annihilation reactions, leaving a small residue of hadrons. The theory predicts that about one neutron remained for every six protons, with the ratio falling to one to seven over time due to neutron decay. This is believed to be correct because, at a later stage, 
the neutrons, and some of the protons fused, leaving hydrogen, a hydrogen isotope called deuterium, helium and other elements, which can be measured. A 1 to 7 ratio of hadrons would indeed produce the observed element ratios in the early and current universe. Upon elimination of antihadrons, the universe is dominated by photons, neutrinos and electron-positron pairs. One refers to this period as the lepton epoch. The quark-gluon plasma that composes the universe cools until hadrons, including baryons, such as protons and neutrons, can form. Initially, hadron-antihadron pairs could form, so matter and antimatter were in thermal equilibrium. However, as the temperature of the universe continued to fall, new hadron-antihadron pairs were no longer produced, and most of the newly formed hadrons and antihadrons annihilated each other, giving rise to pairs of high-energy photons. A comparatively small residue of hadrons remained at about one second of cosmic time, when this epoch ended. The next epoch is baryogenesis. In physical cosmology, baryogenesis is the physical process that is hypothesized to have taken place during the early universe to produce baryonic asymmetry, for instance, the imbalance of matter, baryons, and antimatter antibaryons, in the observed universe. Note. In physical cosmology, the baryon asymmetry problem, also known as the matter asymmetry problem or the matter-antimatter asymmetry problem, is the observed imbalance in baryonic matter, the type of matter experienced in everyday life, and antibaryonic matter in the observable universe. Now, once the universe expanded and cooled to a critical temperature of approximately 2 times 1012 K, quarks combined into normal matter and antimatter and proceeded to annihilate up to the small initial asymmetry of about one part in 5 billion, leaving the matter around us. At some point, an unknown reaction called baryogenesis violated the conservation of baryon number, leading to a very small excess of quarks and leptons over antiquarks and antileptons, of the order of one part in 30 million. This resulted in the predominance of matter over antimatter. Baryogenesis theorizes that for about one in every billion quark antiquark collisions the quark was not annihilated. This asymmetry of quarks to antiquarks is the reason why mass exists today, otherwise particles may have just collided and destroyed each other until the end of time. In 1967, Andrei Sakharov proposed a set of three necessary conditions that a baryon-generating interaction must satisfy to produce matter and antimatter at different rates. These conditions were inspired by the recent discoveries of the cosmic background radiation and CP violation in the neutral kaon system. The three necessary Sakharov conditions are 1. Baryon number violation Baryon number violation is a necessary condition to produce an excess of baryons over anti-baryons. But C symmetry violation is also needed so that the interactions which produce more baryons than anti-baryons will not be counterbalanced by interactions which produce more anti-baryons than baryons. 2. C symmetry and CP symmetry violation. In physics, charge conjugation is a transformation that switches all particles with their corresponding antiparticles, thus changing the sign of all charges, not only electric charge, but also the charges relevant to other forces. The term C symmetry is an abbreviation of the phrase, charge conjugation symmetry, and is used in discussions of the symmetry of physical laws under charge conjugation. Other important discrete symmetries are P symmetry, parity, and T symmetry, time reversal. In particle physics, the second condition for generating baryon asymmetry, violation of charge parity symmetry, is that a process is able to happen at a different rate to its antimatter counterpart. In the standard model, CP violation appears as a complex phase in the quark mixing matrix of the weak interaction. CP violation is a violation of CP symmetry, or charge conjugation parity symmetry, which is the combination of C symmetry, charge symmetry, and P symmetry, parity symmetry. CP symmetry states that the laws of physics should be the same if a particle is interchanged with its antiparticle, C symmetry, while its spatial coordinates are inverted, mirror or P symmetry. 3. Interactions out of thermal equilibrium. In the out of equilibrium decay scenario, the last condition states that the rate of a reaction which generates baryon asymmetry must be less than the rate of expansion of the universe. 
In this situation the particles and their corresponding antiparticles do not achieve thermal equilibrium due to rapid expansion decreasing the occurrence of pair annihilation. In short, Baryon number violation is a necessary condition to produce an excess of baryons over antibaryons. But C symmetry violation is also needed so that the interactions which produce more baryons than antibaryons will not be counterbalanced by interactions which produce more antibaryons than baryons. CP symmetry violation is similarly required because otherwise equal numbers of left handed baryons and right handed antibaryons would be produced as well as equal numbers of left-handed antibaryons and right-handed baryons. Finally, the interactions must be out of thermal equilibrium, since otherwise CPT symmetry would assure compensation between processes increasing and decreasing the baryon number. So, today Buddy covered the stages, thermalization epoch, the cork epoch, baryogenesis, and hadron epoch. He learned the early universe was radiation-dominated. Density of radiation exceeded density of matter. He discovered the emergence and interactions of subatomic particles resulting in the dominance matter over antimatter. As the universe cooled, conditions became just right to give rise to the building blocks of matter, the quarks and electrons. And a few millionths of a second later, quarks aggregated to produce protons and neutrons. If you would like to follow along to see Buddy from town become Buddy of Singularity, please click subscribe and a like would be appreciated. Until next time dear viewers, keep looking up and looking back, way way back. Hello dear viewers, this is A, I, Voice Gary, speaking to you as Buddy from Town's narrator. I hope you are all in good spirits. So far, the Buddy from Town Space Exploration YouTube channel has covered some of the key stages, but not all stages, of the Big Bang for the very early universe. This included, the Big Bang Quantum Singularity, the Planck Epoch, Grand Unification Epoch, Electroweak Epoch, Symmetry Breaking, and Inflationary Epoch and the Rapid Expansion of Space. We then continued into the next video discussing the key Big Bang stages, not all of the stages, that included, Thermalization Epoch, the Quark Epoch, Baryogenesis, and Hadron Epoch. In this third Big Bang and its stages video, Buddy from town will be working his way through the neutrino decoupling and cosmic neutrino background, C new B, and possible formation of primordial black holes. First, neutrino decoupling and cosmic neutrino background. In Big Bang cosmology, neutrino decoupling was the epoch at which neutrinos stopped interacting with other types of matter, and thereby stopped influencing the dynamics of the universe at early times. Prior to decoupling, Neutrinos were in thermal equilibrium with protons, neutrons, and electrons, which was maintained through the weak interaction. Decoupling occurred approximately at the time when the rate of those weak interactions was slower than the rate of expansion of the universe. As neutrinos rarely interact with matter, these neutrinos still exist today, similar to the much later cosmic microwave background emitted during recombination, around 377,000 years after the Big Bang. They form the cosmic neutrino background, abbreviated C nu B or CNB. The cosmic neutrino background is the universe's background particle radiation composed of neutrinos. They are sometimes known as relic neutrinos. Since neutrinos rarely interact with matter, these neutrinos still exist today. They have a very low energy, around 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 6 electron volts, E, V. The neutrinos from this event have a very low energy, around 10 to the minus 10 times smaller than is possible with present-day direct detection. 4. Even high-energy neutrinos are notoriously difficult to detect, so the CNB may not be directly observed in detail for many years, if at all. However, Big Bang cosmology makes many predictions about the CNB, and there is very strong indirect evidence that the CNB exists. One of these predictions is that neutrinos will have left a subtle imprint on the cosmic microwave background, CMB. It is well known that the CMB has irregularities. Some of the CMB fluctuations were roughly regularly spaced, because of the effect of baryon acoustic oscillations. In theory, the decoupled neutrino should have had a very slight effect on the phase of the various CMB fluctuations. In 2015, 
it was reported that such shifts had been detected in the CMB. Moreover, the fluctuations corresponded to neutrinos of almost exactly the temperature predicted by Big Bang Theory, 1.96 plus or minus 0.02, compared to a prediction of 1.95 Kelvin, and exactly three types of neutrino, the same number of neutrino flavors currently predicted by the standard model. The next Big Bang stage is possible formation of primordial black holes. Primordial black holes are a hypothetical type of black hole that formed a mere fraction of a second after the Big Bang. Yakov Borisovich Seldovich and Igor Dmitrievich Novikov, in 1966, first proposed the existence of such black holes. Primordial black holes could have formed in the very early universe during the so-called radiation-dominated era. The essential ingredient for the formation of a primordial black hole is a fluctuation in the density of the universe, inducing its gravitational collapse. Some theories predict that primordial black holes should have popped early because in that fraction of a second after the universe itself began, space was not completely homogeneous, the same at every point. Instead, some areas were denser and hotter than others, and these dense regions could have collapsed into black holes. Depending on when exactly they formed, primordial black holes could have masses as low as 10 to the minus 5 grams, or 100,000 times less than a paperclip, up to about 100,000 times greater than the Sun. The theory behind their origins was first studied in depth by Stephen Hawking in 1971. The idea of such tiny black holes intrigued astrophysicist Stephen Hawking, who explored their quantum mechanical properties. That work led to his 1974 discovery that black holes can evaporate over time. While Hawking ultimately realized a large black hole would evaporate away in more time than the universe has been around so far, small black holes could have indeed evaporated away or currently be doing so, depending on their mass. Hawking calculated that any primordial black hole with a mass greater than 1,012 kg, far less than the mass of any planet, dwarf planet, and most named asteroids and comets in our solar system, could still be around today, while those less massive would have already disappeared. Since primordial black holes did not form from stellar gravitational collapse, their masses can be far below stellar mass. Stellar mass is a phrase that is used by astronomers to describe the mass of a star. Primordial black holes belong to the class of massive compact halo objects, machos. One way to spot machos is by looking for events called microlensing, which occur when a massive object, like a black hole, passes in front of a more distant object, like a star or galaxy. The black hole bends the light from the distant source around it, brightening and magnifying the image. These events are infrequent and short-lived, but catching enough of them could allow astronomers to determine what the objects doing the microlensing are, and whether they could be primordial black holes. Primordial black holes are naturally a good dark matter candidate. They are nearly collisionless and stable, if sufficiently massive. They have non-relativistic velocities, and they form very early in the history of the universe, typically less than one second after the Big Bang. Depending on the model, primordial black holes could have initial masses ranging from 10 to the minus 8 kilograms, the so-called Planck relics, to more than thousands of solar masses. However, Primordial black holes originally having mass lower than 1,011 kg would not have survived to the present due to Hawking radiation. Hawking radiation is black body radiation which is emitted by black holes, due to quantum effects near the event horizon. Because of this, black holes that lose more mass than they gain through other means are expected to shrink and ultimately vanish. Primordial black holes are also non-baryonic, and as such, are plausible dark matter candidates. Primordial black holes are also good candidates for being the seeds of the supermassive black holes at the center of massive galaxies, as well as of intermediate mass black holes. In March 2016, one month after the announcement of the detection by advanced LIGO Virgo of gravitational waves emitted by the merging of 230 solar mass black holes, about 6 times 1031 kilograms, Three groups of researchers proposed independently that the detected black holes had a primordial origin. Two of the groups found that the merging rates inferred by LIGO are consistent with a scenario in which all the dark matter is made of primordial black holes, if a non-negligible fraction of them are somehow clustered within halos, such as faint dwarf galaxies, or globular clusters, 
as expected by the standard theory of cosmic structure formation. The third group claimed that these merging rates are incompatible with an all-dark matter scenario and that primordial black holes could only contribute to less than 1% of the total dark matter. The unexpected large mass of the black holes detected by LIGO has strongly revived interest in primordial black holes with masses in the range of 1 to 100 solar masses. Regardless of where or how they're found, primordial black holes could tell astronomers a lot about the universe we live in. Depending on their mass, they could serve as probes into galaxy evolution, high-energy physics, and even the earliest fractions of a second after the universe was birthed. But, although primordial black holes could exist, they have yet to be seen, and currently remain one of astronomy's great questions. This concludes Buddy's video on the stages of the Big Bang, neutrino decoupling and cosmic neutrino background, and possible formation of primordial black holes. If you would like to follow along to see Buddy from Town become Buddy of Singularity, please click subscribe and a like would be appreciated. Until next time dear viewers, keep looking up and looking back, way way back. Hello dear viewers, this is A, I voice, Gary, speaking to you as Buddy from Town's narrator. I hope you are all in good spirits. So far, the Buddy from Town Space Exploration YouTube channel has covered some of the key stages, but not all stages, of the Big Bang, for the very early universe. This included, the Big Bang Quantum Singularity, the Planck Epoch, Grand Unification Epoch, Electroweak Epoch, Symmetry Breaking, and Inflationary Epoch and the Rapid Expansion of Space. We then continued into the next video discussing the key Big Bang stages, not all of the stages that included, Thermalization Epoch, the Quark Epoch, Baryogenesis, and Hadron Epoch. We then continued with the next video about neutrino decoupling and cosmic neutrino background and possible formation of primordial black holes. In this third Big Bang in its stages video, Buddy from Town will be working his way through a lepton epoch summary, photon epoch, nucleosynthesis of light elements, and matter domination. First, a brief look at the lepton epoch. The lepton epoch was the period in the evolution of the early universe in which the leptons dominated the mass of the universe. It started about one second after the Big Bang. The majority of hadrons and antihadrons had annihilated each other at the end of the hadron epoch, leaving leptons, such as the electron, muons, and certain neutrinos, as well as antileptons, dominating the mass of the universe. At this stage, the temperature of the universe was still high enough to create neutrino and electron-positron pairs. The lepton epoch follows a similar path to the earlier hadron epoch. Initially, leptons and antileptons are produced in pairs. About 10 seconds after the Big Bang, the temperature of the universe falls to the point at which new lepton-antilepton pairs are no longer created, and most remaining leptons and antileptons quickly annihilated each other giving rise to pairs of high-energy photons, and a small residue of electrons, needed to charge neutralize the universe, remained along with free-streaming neutrinos. An important aspect of this epoch is the neutrino decoupling. The next Big Bang stage is the photon epoch. The photon epoch was the period in the evolution of the early universe in which photons dominated the energy of the universe. This epoch started after most leptons and antileptons were annihilated at the end of the lepton epoch, which took place between 10 seconds and 370,000 years after the Big Bang. After most leptons and antileptons are annihilated at the end of the lepton epoch, most of the mass energy in the universe is left in the form of photons. Much of the rest of its mass energy is in the form of neutrinos and other relativistic particles. Therefore, the energy of the universe, and its overall behavior, is dominated by its photons. For the remainder of the photon epoch, the universe contained a hot dense plasma of nuclei, electrons, and photons. These photons continue to interact frequently with charged particles, like electrons, protons, and eventually, nuclei. They continue to do so for about the next 370,000 years. 370,000 years after the Big Bang, the temperature of the universe fell to the point where nuclei could combine with electrons to create neutral atoms. 
As a result, photons no longer interacted frequently with matter, the universe became transparent and the cosmic microwave background radiation was created, and then structure formation took place. Over time, photons and matter became less densely packed as the universe expanded. Most of the energy density of the universe was in the form of photons. As the universe expanded, the density of photons and matter reduced. The stretching of space in the expansion increases the wavelength of the photons, reducing their energy. This does not happen to particles of matter. So, while both matter and photons were becoming less densely packed, the photons were also losing energy. The energy density of the universe was becoming biased towards the matter content rather than the photon content. The next stage of the Big Bang is nucleosynthesis of light elements, or Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which took place between 2 minutes and 20 minutes after the Big Bang. Atomic nuclei were created in the process of nucleosynthesis, which occurred during the first few minutes of the photon epoch. Note. Nucleosynthesis is the process that creates new atomic nuclei from pre-existing nucleons and nuclei. According to current theories, the first nuclei were formed a few minutes after the Big Bang, through nuclear reactions in the process, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. The primordial yields of light elements are determined by the competition between the expansion rate of the universe, the Hubble parameter H, and the rates of the weak and nuclear reactions. It is the weak interaction, interconverting neutrons and protons, that largely determines the amount of helium-4 which may be synthesized, while detailed nuclear reaction rates regulate the production, and destruction, of the other light elements. Between about 2 and 20 minutes after the Big Bang, the temperature and pressure of the universe allowed nuclear fusion to occur, giving rise to nuclei of a few light elements beyond hydrogen. About 25% of the protons, and all the neutrons, fuse to form deuterium, a hydrogen isotope, and most of the deuterium quickly fuses to form helium-4. Atomic nuclei will easily unbind, or break apart, above a certain temperature, related to their binding energy. From about 2 minutes, the falling temperature means that deuterium no longer unbinds, and is stable, and starting from about 3 minutes, helium and other elements formed by the fusion of deuterium, also no longer unbind and are stable. The short duration and falling temperature means that only the simplest and fastest fusion processes can occur. Only tiny amounts of nuclei beyond helium are formed, because nucleosynthesis of heavier elements is difficult, and requires thousands of years, even in stars. Small amounts of tritium, another hydrogen isotope, and beryllium-7 and 8 are formed, but these are unstable and are quickly lost again. A small amount of deuterium is left unfused because of the very short duration. Therefore, the only stable nuclides created by the end of Big Bang nucleosynthesis are protium, single proton hydrogen nucleus, and deuterium, helium-3, helium-4, and lithium-7. By mass, the resulting matter is about 75% hydrogen nuclei, 25% helium nuclei, and perhaps 10 to the negative 10 by mass of lithium-7. The next most common stable isotopes produced are lithium-6, beryllium-9, boron-11, and carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, CNO, but these have predicted to be essentially undetectable and negligible. Because of the very short period in which nucleosynthesis occurred, before it was stopped by expansion and cooling, about 20 minutes, no elements heavier than beryllium, or possibly boron, could be formed. Elements formed during this time were in the plasma state, and did not cool to the state of neutral atoms until much later. The amounts of each light element in the early universe can be estimated from old galaxies, and is strong evidence for the Big Bang. The Big Bang nucleosynthesis theory predicts that roughly 25% of the mass of the universe consists of helium. It also predicts about 0.01% deuterium, and even smaller quantities of lithium. The important point is that the prediction depends critically on the density of baryons, like neutrons and protons, at the time of nucleosynthesis. Furthermore, one value of this baryon density can explain all the abundances at once, in terms of the present-day critical density of matter, the required density of baryons is a few percent, note. 
the exact value depends on the assumed value of the Hubble constant. This relatively low value means that not all of the dark matter can be baryonic, so for example, we are forced to consider more exotic particle candidates. The fact that helium is nowhere seen to have an abundance below 23% mass, is very strong evidence that the universe went through an early hot phase. This is one of the cornerstones of the hot Big Bang model. The next Big Bang stage is the matter-dominated era. This era was the epoch in the evolution of the universe which took place 47,000 years after the Big Bang. The matter-dominated era epoch began after the radiation-dominated era ended, when the universe was about 380,000 years old. Although it is often said that we still live in the matter-dominated era, it is more correct to say that when the universe was about 5 billion years old, this era ended, and was replaced by the dark energy-dominated era. This change of the perspective occurred when the cosmological constant, or dark energy, was first observed in the late 1990s. In the matter-dominated era, the energy density of matter exceeds the energy density of radiation in the universe, and it should exceed the vacuum energy density, like dark energy, also. Until now, the universe's large-scale dynamics and behavior have been determined mainly by radiation, meaning, those constituents move relativistically, at or near the speed of light, such as photons and neutrinos. As the universe cools, from around 47,000 years, the universe's large-scale behavior becomes dominated by matter instead. Around, or shortly after 47,000 years, the densities of non-relativistic matter, atomic nuclei, and relativistic radiation, photons, become equal, known as the gene's length, which determines the smallest structures that can form, due to competition between gravitational attraction and pressure effects, begins to fall in perturbations, instead of being wiped out by free-streaming radiation, can begin to grow in amplitude. According to the Lambda CDM model, by this stage, the matter in the universe is around 84.5% cold dark matter, and 15.5% ordinary matter. There is overwhelming evidence that dark matter exists and dominates our universe, but since the exact nature of dark matter is still not understood, the Big Bang theory does not presently cover any stages in its formation. From this point on, and for several billion years to come, the presence of dark matter accelerates the formation of structure in our universe. In the early universe, dark matter gradually gathers in huge filaments under the effects of gravity, collapsing faster than ordinary, baryonic matter because its collapse is not slowed by radiation pressure. This amplifies the tiny inhomogeneities, or irregularities, in the density of the universe which was left by cosmic inflation. Over time, slightly denser regions become more dense, and slightly rarefied, emptier, regions become more rarefied. Ordinary matter eventually gathers together faster than it would otherwise do, because of the presence of these concentrations of dark matter. The properties of dark matter that allow it to collapse quickly without radiation pressure, also mean that it cannot lose energy by radiation either. Losing energy is necessary for particles to collapse into dense structures beyond a certain point. Therefore, dark matter collapses into huge, but diffuse filaments and halos, and not into stars or planets. Ordinary matter, which can lose energy by radiation, forms dense objects and also gas clouds when it collapses. The matter era began right after the radiation era. There is a transition to the matter era since there is a presence, and predominance, of matter in the universe. The matter era consists of three major epochs, atomic, galactic, and stellar, which span for billions of years. Including present day. This concludes Buddy's video on the stages of the Big Bang, the photon epoch, nucleosynthesis of light elements, and matter domination. If you would like to follow along to see Buddy from town become Buddy of Singularity, please click subscribe and a like would be appreciated. Until next time dear viewers, keep looking up and looking back, way way back. Hello dear viewers, this is AI Voice Gary, speaking to you as Buddy from town's narrator. I hope you are all in good spirits. I am in no spirits, as I am just an AI voice. 
So far, the Buddy from Town Space Exploration YouTube channel has covered some of the key stages, but not all stages, of the Big Bang for the very early and early universe. This included, the Big Bang Quantum Singularity, the Planck Epoch, Grand Unification Epoch, Electroweak Epoch, Symmetry Breaking, and Inflationary Epoch, and the Rapid Expansion of Space. We then continued with the next video discussing the key Big Bang stages, not all of the stages, that included, Thermalization Epoch, the Quark Epoch, Baryogenesis, and Hadron Epoch. In the next video, Buddy from Town discussed Neutrino Decoupling and Cosmic Neutrino Background, CNB, and possible formation of primordial black holes. In the most recent Big Bang and its stages video, Buddy discussed a Lepton Epoch summary, Photon Epoch, nucleosynthesis of light elements, and matter domination. In this newest video, Buddy from Town will be discussing the Big Bang stages, recombination, photon decoupling, and the cosmic microwave background, CMB. In cosmology, recombination refers to the epoch at which charged electrons and protons first became bound to form electrically neutral hydrogen atoms. Recombination occurred about 370,000 years after the Big Bang. At the end of the photon epoch, the matter elements are increasingly space of freedom, the space between each particle extends, and collisions diminish, but all the photons are absorbed again, and the light cannot escape, so the universe remains opaque, or invisible. It will take a certain density and a certain temperature, almost equal to 3000 Kelvin, so that the photons get complete freedom. This moment is called time of last scattering, and happens about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Photons interacted primarily with electrons through Thomson scattering. For instance, the elastic scattering of electromagnetic radiation by a free charged particle. Thomson scattering is the low energy limit of Compton scattering, and is a valid description in the regime where the photon energy is much less than the rest mass energy of the electron. In this process, the electron can be thought of as being made to oscillate in the electromagnetic field of the photon causing it, in turn, to emit radiation at the same frequency as the incident wave, and thus, the wave is scattered. An important feature of Thomson scattering is that it introduces polarization along the direction of motion of the electron. From this time, the electrons will be able to stay in a space around the nuclei without being collided by photons. Therefore, the electrons and protons will constitute the primordial matter and photons will be free to travel in space, and become immensely large. The universe becomes visible, as the light begins to spread freely. This is what is called recombination in cosmology, the period when the temperature dropped enough to allow electrons to bind to nuclei, and form the first neutral atoms. Recombination also marks the time when the universe became transparent, as photons can travel long distances before being absorbed, or diffused by matter. It is not within the universe that is visible, but its surface, just like the sun is the photosphere of the sun, as seen from Earth, and not the inner layers of our star. Thus, as we look back in time, with even our most powerful photon-collecting telescopes, the epoch of recombination is the ultimate frontier, the furthest location and the earliest time we can reach with electromagnetic radiation. Once photon and baryons have decoupled, the latter are no longer compelled to have the, the same temperature as the photons. Now, we will look at the stage, photon decoupling. In cosmology, the term, decoupling, refers to a term that describes the event 300,000 years after the Big Bang, where the universe had finally cooled enough so that ordinary matter could form, and photons could travel in a free path. It is a period in the development of the universe when different types of particles fall out of thermal equilibrium with each other. This occurs as a result of the expansion of the universe, as their interaction rates decrease, and mean free paths increase, up to this critical point. During decoupling, the universe goes from opaque to transparent. The two verified instances of decoupling since the Big Bang, which are most often discussed are, photon decoupling, and neutrino decoupling, as these led to the cosmic microwave background, and cosmic neutrino background, respectively. This production of photons is known as decoupling, 
which leads to recombination sometimes being called photon decoupling, but recombination and photon decoupling are distinct events. Photon decoupling occurred during the epoch known as the recombination, which occurred about 378,000 years after the Big Bang, when the universe was a hot opaque, or foggy, plasma. During recombination, free electrons became bound to protons, hydrogen nuclei, to form neutral hydrogen atoms. Because direct recombinations to the ground state, or lowest energy, of hydrogen are very inefficient, these hydrogen atoms generally form with the electrons in a high energy state, and the electrons quickly transition to their low energy state by emitting photons. Because the neutral hydrogen that formed was transparent to light, those photons which were not captured by other hydrogen atoms were able, for the first time in the history of the universe, to travel long distances. They can still be detected today, although they now appear as radio waves, and form the cosmic microwave background, CMB. They reveal crucial clues about how the universe formed. Once photons decoupled from matter, they traveled freely through the universe without interacting with matter, and constitute what is observed today, as cosmic microwave background radiation, in that sense, the cosmic background radiation is infrared, and some red, black body radiation emitted when the universe was at a temperature of some 3000 Kelvin, redshifted by a factor of 1100, from the visible spectrum to the microwave spectrum. Recombination lasts for about 100 Ka, during which the universe is becoming more and more transparent to photons. The photons of the cosmic microwave background radiation originate at this time. The spherical volume of space, which will become the observable universe, is 42 million light-years in radius at this time. The baryonic matter density at this time, is about 500 million hydrogen and helium atoms per cubic meter, approximately a billion times higher than today. This density corresponds to pressure on the order of 10 negative 17 A. Photon decoupling has ensured that light can travel freely in a sea of hydrogen. However, there were no stars at this point. The cosmic microwave background is the only light source. This is the dark age of the universe, a time before stars. We can see galaxies being formed 200 million years after the Big Bang. And, we can peer back farther still. We can directly see light emitted the moment the universe became transparent. This is the cosmic microwave background, CMB. In Big Bang cosmology, the cosmic microwave background, CMB, is electromagnetic radiation, which is a remnant from an early stage of the universe, also known as relic radiation. The CMB is faint cosmic background radiation filling all space. It is thought to be leftover radiation from the Big Bang, or the time when the universe began. As the theory goes, when the universe was born, it underwent a rapid inflation and expansion. As the universe continued to expand, it cooled to the point where electrons were able to combine with protons to form hydrogen atoms, aka the recombination period. In the absence of free electrons, the photons were able to move unhindered through the universe, and it began to appear as it does today, transparent and permeated by light. Over the intervening billions of years, the universe continued to expand and cooled greatly. Due to the expansion of space, the wavelengths of the photons grew, became redshifted to roughly 1 mm, and their effective temperature decreased to just above absolute zero negative 2.7 Kelvin, or minus 270 degrees Celsius, minus 454 degrees Fahrenheit. This means its radiation is most visible in the microwave part of the electromagnetic spectrum. These photons fill the universe today, and appear as a background glow that can be detected in the far infrared, and radio wavelengths. The existence of this radiation has helped to inform our understanding of how the universe began. The CMB is visible at a distance of 13.8 billion light years in all directions from Earth leading scientists to determine that this is the true age of the universe. However, it is not an indication of the true extent of the universe. Given that space has been in a state of expansion ever since the early universe, and is expanding faster than the speed of light, the CMB is merely the farthest back in time we are capable of seeing. The CMB is useful to scientists because it helps us learn how the early universe was formed. 
it is at a uniform temperature with only small fluctuations visible with precise telescopes. NASA wrote, by studying these fluctuations, cosmologists can learn about the origin of galaxies and large-scale structures of galaxies, and they can measure the basic parameters of the Big Bang theory. In 2013, data from the European Space Agency's Planck Space Telescope was released, showing the highest precision picture of the CMB, yet. Scientists uncovered another mystery with this information. Fluctuations in the CMB at large angular scales did not match predictions. Planck also confirmed what WMAP saw in terms of the asymmetry, and the cold spot. Planck's final data release in 2018 showed more proof that dark matter and dark energy, mysterious forces that are likely behind the acceleration of the universe, do seem to exist. The future of the CMB According to various cosmological theories, the universe may at some point cease expanding and begin reversing, culminating in a collapse, followed by another Big Bang, aka, the Big Crunch theory. In another scenario, known as the Big Rip, the expansion of the universe will eventually lead to all matter and space-time, itself, being torn apart. If neither of these scenarios are correct, and the universe continued to expand at an accelerating rate, the CMB will continue redshifting to the point where it is no longer detectable. At this point, it will be overtaken by the first starlight created in the universe, and then by background radiation fields produced by processes that are assumed will take place in the future of the universe. This concludes Buddy's video on the stages of the Big Bang, recombination, photon decoupling, and the cosmic microwave background. If you would like to follow along to see Buddy from town become Buddy of Singularity, please click subscribe, and a like would be appreciated. Until next time dear viewers, keep looking up and looking back, way way back.